Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church of Bennington, Vermont. Uh, we are glad to have you with us today. I wish all of our ladies a happy Mother's Day, and we're so glad to have you here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, perhaps uh, watching on CATTV or later on tape, I'm Dr. Alan Eagles, and I'm a professor at Northeastern Baptist College here in town. I uh, teach Hebrew and Old Testament. And my wife and I are members of our church here, and it's always a delight for me to be able to share God's Word with you. <clears throat> uh, we are singing these days, and we ask that you sing with your mask on and in a normal voice. Don't overdo it. They, when I was a kid, they, the preachers would always encourage us to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> allergies are giving me this morning, the preachers would always urge us to, to raise the roof or blow out the windows, and uh, we're, we're not doing that these days, so we're singing in our normal voices. Charlie will now get us started with our music meditation. Uh, this is a time for us to pause, to reflect, to meditate. Calm our hearts and prepare them for worship. Thank you. 
our service when we pause to clear accounts with the Lord. I think this is a good thing that we do. Our call to confession this morning is from Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Let's pause for a moment of silent prayer as we confess our sins to the Lord. Our assurance of forgiveness is taken from the same psalm, verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. My second hymn this morning is hymn number 509. 509, Happy the Home When God is There. God had his blessing to the reading of his word. 
we come now to the time when, in more normal days, we would take up our offering. We would pass the plates. Obviously, we're not doing that today. Uh, but there are our plates here at the front, if you have not already had an opportunity to put your offering in, uh, you may do so after the service. But our offerings are a part of our worship. It's an, it's an integral part of our worship time. So we pause to think about all that God has given to us and what God is calling us to give back to Him for the needs of the ministry, the needs the, of the ministry and the outreach of the church still go on, even in days such as these. So we pause now for our offering. there wasn't a Mother's Day holiday back then. So we have to look at some texts and infer from them what Jesus might have done on a day such as this one. 
Perhaps you saw some years ago the movie The Passion of the Christ. You remember early on in the movie, Jesus is at home and his mother's there. And she's, I think she's calling him in to dinner. And he's been working in the wood shop and, and building a table. And to understand in the ancient world, most did not use tables as we do. They sat on the floor and there would be a mat on the floor on which they would place all their food. And that was their table. And so he's building this table, and it's a real novelty. She's asking him, what on earth is this? And he's trying to explain the table and chairs to her, but he hasn't made the chairs yet. And so they're, they're trying to sit like they're sitting at the table, and she says, it'll never catch on. <laughs> mm. But there's, there's this humor between Jesus and his mother that I don't think was at all inappropriate. They were kidding one another and teasing one another. Would Jesus wish Mary a happy Mother's Day? Well, let's take a look at some passages. Uh, I'm an Old Testament professor, so of course I'm going to start in the Old Testament. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to run you through a Bible drill this morning. When I was a kid, we would do these Bible drills. We'd have to hold our Bible up by the binder so we couldn't have our finger in anywhere. And they'd say, Bible's up, and they'd give us a passage, and we'd have to all race to see who could get to it first. I'm going to run you through a Bible drill this morning. So if that sounds familiar, there we go. Exodus chapter 20, in the Ten Commandments, verse 12, it says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Of course, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Ten Commandments are repeated again as Moses re-gives the law from Mount Sinai just as they're about to enter the promised land. And there it says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land. The Lord your God is giving you. So the law of Moses was very clear that we are to honor, to respect our parents. There wasn't a, a Hebrew word that meant parents, so most of these passages will say father and mother. We shouldn't let that bother us. They just didn't have a separate word for parents collectively. Honor your father your mother. It's a part of the law, and in fact, in the Ten Commandments, it's the fifth of the Ten Commandments. It stands right between the first four commandments, which have to do with our treatment of God. No other gods, no graven images, no taking the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the last five commandments, which have to do with our relationship with others. No murdering, no committing adultery, no stealing, no bearing false witness, no coveting. And it seems appropriate to me that honor, father and mother, is in the Big Ten. It's right there in the Ten Commandments, which kind of sum up the spirit of the law of Moses. And it's right there between our, our respect for God and our treatment of others. It holds an important place in the Ten Commandments. So, surely, Jesus knew the law. He knew the Word of God well. He would have understood the meaning and the importance of this commandment. Other passages in the Old Testament... Uh, talk about our treatment of our parents. So if you want to flip over to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 10. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1, the section which is headed, the Proverbs of Solomon. So the very first Proverbs in this new section of the book because chapters 1 through 9 are wisdom discourse. And beginning with chapter 10, we get the, the Proverbs 
the short, pithy sayings that are, are so uh, typical of the book of Proverbs. The very first proverb in the wisdom, the Proverbs of Solomon, is a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Now, we want to be careful that we don't split this out and say, well, a wise son makes his, his father happy, but a, a bad son only makes his mother sad. No, it's, it's saying both. It was typical of these kinds of proverbs and the parallels, and for you to, to read these two lines and then put them together and see the, the larger picture. A wise son makes his parents happy, but a foolish son is a sorrow to them. There's another proverb. In fact, well, there's a number of proverbs in the book of Proverbs about parents and fathers and mothers and our care for them. But take a look at chapter 15, verse 20. Chapter 15, verse 20. A wise son makes a glad father. The first line is, in fact, identical with 10.1. But a foolish man despises his mother. Again, we, we put these together. A wise son is, in fact, a joy to his parents. But a foolish son despises them, mistreats them, does not give them the respect and the honor that they're due. So, in the wisdom, the book of Proverbs is about wise living, skillful living. The writer of Proverbs says uh, any number of times that we ought to treat our parents with love and respect. So the Old Testament clearly teaches respect for parents. What did Jesus himself say about the way we treat our parents? Well, we'll start out with Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Did not put enough post-its in here. Matthew chapter 15. I don't need the rain verses here. The Pharisees and the scribes, beginning in verse 1, came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. The, the Pharisees were really big on all of these rules that the elders had come up with. And in some ways, they their heart was headed in the right direction. They wanted to protect the law, and so they built up rules around the law. They built up a hedge or a fence around the law so that people, if they followed their picky little rules, wouldn't even get close to violating God's laws. It sounds like it's a good thing, but of course it led to all kinds of problems because when you start adding to God's word, it becomes a very dangerous thing. But the Pharisees and the scribes are challenging Jesus on this. Your, your disciples don't wash their hands. Ugh. Of course, in days of COVID, we'd probably agree with them. Pass the hand cleaner around again. But you notice Jesus' answer. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother. And, he quotes a different passage, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you had, would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites! He goes on to quote Isaiah. The Pharisees, they, in order to, to amass their wealth and to, and to build their, themselves up, they said, well, 
I've declared everything that I own Corbin. Corbin is an old Hebrew word, which means a gift. So if I've declared my belongings a gift to God, everything is dedicated to the Lord, then when it comes time to take care of my parents, well, oh, uh, mom and dad, I'm so sorry. I've given everything to God. I, I can't help you. Sorry I can't help you. And Jesus says, You're, you are trashing the commandments of God for the sake of your man-made traditions. And he, he rubs their nose in this contradiction. This very discussion is recorded in Matthew, but it's also recorded in Mark chapter 7. So it occurs twice in the Gospels. Hmm. How did Jesus look at honoring Father and mother. Let's look at another passage. Flip over to Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19. Familiar story of the rich young man, young rich young ruler. And behold, a, a man came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, uh, enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Well, you understand the Pharisees, the uh, religious, religious rulers of Jesus' day, had numbered the commandments. There were 613 of them in the law. Which one should I keep? Which one's most important? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first of these come out of the Ten Commandments. You're familiar with them. We just spoke about them. Interestingly, he puts the commandments about our relationship with others before the command to honor parents. It's like he's building up to it. I don't think that's an accident. And then he quotes out of Leviticus, love your neighbor. So Jesus gives him some of the 613, right out of the 10, and other passages. So then what? The young man said to him, all of these I have kept. What do I still lack? Oh, he's obeyed all of the rules of the law. All of them. All 613. Hmm. It's interesting, Jesus doesn't challenge that directly. What does he do? He says... If you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Sadly, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Familiar story. But what strikes me in the context of Mother's Day is of those commandments that Jesus enumerates for this young man. He says, honor father and mother. Jesus saw the importance of that command. And he puts it out in front of this rich young man. And the young man probably can't see the fact that he has not, in fact, been obedient to all of the commandments. For he was undoubtedly a teenager at some point. <laughs> and I don't need to say any more than about that, do I? <laughs> we, we, we've probably all not shown our parents the respect at all times that we should have. 
Interestingly, this particular episode is recorded not only in Matthew, but in Mark chapter 10 and Luke chapter 18. So this story is told in three of the four Gospels. Honor, father and mother, is not just an Old Testament command, but it's, it's repeated in two separate episodes, five different times in the Gospels, by Jesus. Would Jesus wish his mother a happy Mother's Day? Hmm. Let's go one more step. Let's look at the teachings of Paul. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's flip over to Ephesians chapter 6. You know the way to find Ephesians, right? You know, Paul's epistles, General Electric Power Company. <laughs> Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You can always find it. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse, begin with verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. According to the Old Testament, honor your father and mother. He throws in little parentheses here. This is the first commandment with a promise. Then he completes the quotation, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. So Paul, as he talks to the believers at Ephesus about relationships, Parents and children, servants and masters. He says, this commandment in the Old Testament is still valid in the New Covenant. Honor your parents. He says, this is the first commandment with promise. If you go back and read through the Ten Commandments, that is the case. The command against Misusing God's name has a penalty attached. But it's not till long you get down to the fifth commandment that there's a promise attached. If you want to live long in the land that God has given you, of course he was speaking in the Old Testament to Israel, the land of Canaan that he was about to bring them into. We need to be careful there, but still... This was a commandment with a promise attached. And Paul draws attention to that. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, he urges them to honor and respect their parents, but he does not specifically go back and quote from the Ten Commandments in the book of Colossians. Ephesians and Colossians, as you may realize, are kind of twin letters. They were probably written about the same time to two separate churches, and so there's a lot of common material there, but it kind of gives us a stereoscopic view of the Christian life when you study Ephesians and Colossians side by side. So, Jesus certainly knew the command to honor parents, honor father and mother. But how did he do on that score? Let's take a look at three episodes in his life. Let's start with Luke chapter 2. And these are all familiar passages, but I hope that by, by bringing them together this morning that we'll, we'll get a fresh perspective. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now his parents, that is Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. There were three pilgrimage festivals in Israel, of which one was Passover. And everyone able to come was expected to come up to Jerusalem to make their offerings and to celebrate the feast. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey 
But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. I saw a meme the other day that, that said, if you think you're not a good parent, just remember Jesus' parents lost him for three days. <laughs> we probably can't do much worse than that, can we? <laughs> After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, it's, it, it's as though he's kind of puzzled by this whole thing. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? ESV capitalizes Father in this verse, and probably rightly so. He's talking about his heavenly Father. He understood who he was. He understood his mission. He understood why he was here. And they did not understand the saying he spoke to them. But he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Some of us had wonderful parents. I certainly count myself among those. Some of us may not have had as good of parents. But think about this. If you think that maybe you didn't have the best parents, think about Jesus. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was the Son of God. And Mary and Joseph were sinners like us. Let's sink in a second. And he went back home with them and was submissive to them. Sometimes we think, oh, I shouldn't have to submit to my parents. They, they weren't any good. They didn't do everything the way I think they should have. That wasn't Jesus' attitude. Jesus was perfect. And he submitted to his parents. What a rebuke to us. Did Jesus practice what he preached? Did he honor father and mother? Yes, he did. Let's flip over then to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. There's good indication that Joseph died at some point in between. In Luke chapter 2, Joseph and Mary are obviously both there. Uh, in John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana in Galilee, Mary is mentioned, Joseph is not at the cross, as we'll see in a moment. Joseph was evidently not there. So at some point, Joseph passed away. And Jesus, as the oldest son of the family, would take responsibility for the care of his mother. So, there's a wedding in Galilee, at the city of Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding, and his disciples when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. You can add hint, hint. <laughs> and Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Let's stop there for just a moment. Some take offense at the fact that he called his mother woman. Apparently, in Greek, this was 
much like our mama. This, this wasn't mean, this wasn't putting her down. The fact that he doesn't call her mother is not significant. He, he was saying, yes ma'am. If any of you have lived in the South, you know what yes ma'am means. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He's just begun to teach. He's begun to gather his disciples. And he says, no, 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 not yet. But his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. She's not going to take no for an answer. So what does he do? Storms out? No. Now there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. You know the rest of the story. Somewhere along the line, when they're drawing up this out to take to the master of the feast, or while they're going to the master of the feast, this water turns to wine. And not just any wine, but the best of the best. Jesus performs his first miracle in his ministry at the request of his mother. And all the way through this, he treats her with respect. He's now in his early 30s, we're told in the Gospels. And yet he does this at the request of his mom. One more passage. John chapter 19. A passage that we read just a bit ago, the crucifixion of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I think if I were being crucified, I'd have a lot to think about. Oh, I'd have a lot on my mind. I probably should stop and use the restroom first. <laughs> right? And wouldn't you be honest with me? Wouldn't you be thinking something like that? And he's being crucified between two thieves, and they're, they're gambling for his garments. And he knew this day was coming. He'd known all along that he was going to the cross. And his father's gone, his earthly father, Joseph. And in the midst of all these things, as he hangs on the cross in agony, He thinks of his mother. For his mother, Mary, is standing there with some of the other women who have been following him, and his disciples. He sees particularly John standing there, the disciple whom he loved. It's the way John refers to himself in the Gospel. For apparently Jesus and John were especially close. Jesus says to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. One of the issues that the commentaries raise on this passage is, what about Jesus' brothers? We know there were brothers. Why didn't he tell them, step up and take care of mom? We don't know. The only thing I can think of is Jesus knows that those brothers, in fact, are going to be martyred early on in the church's history. Perhaps he chose John specifically because he knew 
in God's plans, John would live a long life. John is the only one of the original 12 disciples who died a natural death, died of old age. Perhaps that's why Jesus chose John. But Jesus, in the horrors of crucifixion, saw to the care of his mother. Hmm. Would Jesus wish his mother a happy Mother's Day? What do you think? I think he would have. I think he would have gotten something for her. I think he would have taken care of her. Jesus sets an example for us in this, as in so many things. So, happy Mother's Day. You guys probably, you know, have no idea how far the ministry of this church reaches. Their services are taped each week. You know, when we were apart, those were taped earlier in the week and put on for the weekend. You could kind of go to church here remotely. Now, of course, we're recording them on Sunday. They don't get up for a couple of days. But I received a letter from a woman in North Carolina this week. Telling me that she appreciated my sermon, the last sermon that I preached. And of course, I said, Thank you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> People out there can see these services, it, it provides an opportunity for others to hear the Word of God through our church. When I went into ministry, you know, it's, it's it's very rare in those days for someone to become the pastor of the church they grew up in, have their parents in their own congregation. I never imagined that. My mom would be able to listen to my sermons, hear me preach. I guess I need to be careful what I say, right? <laughs> anyways. So. Happy Mother's Day to my mom. Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers in our congregation. Those of you who've had children, who have adopted children, who want children. Happy Mother's Day. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 278, Amazing Grace. Oh, my God. 
and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Any